Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ, so very grateful, so very thankful for the opportunity that you've given us to continue studying in your word together in this special way. We are indeed living in perilous times, and I am so grateful, we are so grateful for that great contrast between the perilous times that we're living and our blessed hope that you've given us. I just ask that you would guide us into all truth, that you would filter out all of the error, all the foolishness, but just seal to our hearts, our hungry hearts, that which is truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in the uh, epistle of Jude. And if you've been following along, we're in uh, about the area of verse 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. It's difficult to not read this verse and not see how that these individuals are functioning, performing uh, by means of the flesh through natural means, natural instincts, that which seems right, that which feels good, that uh, experienced based relationship which is really not based on doctrine but more on experience and what they have invented in their minds and believed to be true. It is in these things that they corrupt themselves. And we got to verse 11, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain. So we're going to be looking at a few individuals here. Cain, we know, uh, if you're at all, any, if you're at all familiar with the account of Cain and Abel, it was, I, I think, that one of the most uh, significant facts that we need to take note of was the sacrifices they offered to God. Cain presented works, lordship salvation, Abel presented a blood sacrifice in Genesis chapter 4. Abel's sacrifice was acceptable. And of course, why wouldn't it be? Because that was the type of the blood sacrifice of Christ. But Cain's was not. And so he was envious. In uh, 1 John chapter 3, we read, Marvel not, my brethren, if the world hates you, we know that we have passed from death unto life because we love the brethren. He that loveth not his brother abideth in death. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. So, and so, there, so therefore Cain slew his brother. He was envious. What's I, what I really find interesting about that, folks, is that we see that passed down from generation, that same principle and effect even today when it comes to the Arab-Israeli conflict, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict today. It's uh, a difference in sacrifice and worship. Uh, there's a lot of envy that's involved in that because we're looking at two seeds entirely different seeds. There, there, are, there was the seed that Christ planted and then there was the seed that Satan sowed and when Jesus was asked about the weed and the tare, that there was tare growing among the weed, he said he did not sow that, but that an enemy hath done this. Those of you who are familiar with the seventh chapter of Matthew in verse 21, not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father. Well, okay, now we're under law. 
You see, Steve, we're under law. Because we've got to do His will. We can't just know it. We've got to do it. So therefore, we're under law. And that is not what the text is saying. Not at all. He that doeth the will of my Father. Well, does your flesh do the will of, of the Father? Would be my question. God's will is that you believe on, on He whom He has sent, God has sent, which is in heaven. Verse 22 of the same chapter in Matthew begins, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in Thy name, and in Thy name have cast out devils, and in Thy name done many wonderful works? It's hard not to... To see that is, is not related to the text in which we're studying of these individuals who have crept in unawares. These aren't people outside the fellowship. They are among God's children. A mixture of terror and wheat, sheep and goats. And in thy name have we not done many wonderful works. So we know that it's, there's a problem here if we're looking at, at, at our relationship with Christ if it's according to works. If it was according to works, then, then we'd, have, we'd have some difficulty with this passage. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Not I once did, but I never knew you. Not I once did, and now I don't. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that worketh, work iniquity. I knew a, a pastor one time. This has been many, many years ago. It was during an evening service where the young man uh, was really uh, led and moved to come forward to the front when uh, the pastor gave an altar call. And the pastor told this young man that who had who was asking how what he had to do to become saved. He said to this dear man, "Well, if, if, if get rid of those cigarettes in your in your front shirt pocket first, and then I'll talk to you." What if Jesus didn't talk to the Samaritan? woman and it says that these individuals here in our text they ran greedily after the error of Balaam Balaam for reward I, th I think that there is a lot of Balaam today preaching error for money Balaam wanted the rewards for his work. As a prophet of the Lord, he wanted to make money at it. He wanted to entice people into error so that God would judge them and that he would profit by it. If you follow idols, God will judge you. So, God presents Cain, and now he's presenting Balaam. Uh, I, once again, as I said in a previous video, I've, I've tried to look at a common denominator here. I'm not sure that there is one. And the reason why that there, I don't believe that there is a, a common denom denominator, other than the fact that they are not God's children, that they're of a different seed, that they are clearly in the text, it's, it's, they're unmistakably the seed that Satan sowed. They're unmistakably tear, not wheat, goats, not sheep. The way that that manifests itself in a life, it manifests itself, error, doctrinal error, manifests itself in a life in a, in a way that is far-reaching. 
Uh, there's a, a wide scope of it's it's like I mentioned in a previous video I believe in this in this series here that what we're looking at is everything from legalism on the one hand to licentiousness the two opposite extremes and just about everything in between the text goes on to say that they perished in the gainsaying of, of Korah or core if you're if you're uh, using the King James version we know that uh, we, we know quite a bit about Moses we know that Moses trusted God that Moses was meek he wasn't anything like Korah made him out to be Korah said you know there, there's a whole lot of people here and 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 you're just one you and you and Aaron you're just two people Gainsaying means to set aside. It means to, to go against the Word of God. Basically, what Korah was saying was, I'm as well qualified as you are. You're not the only true servant of the Lord here. So what Korah did was he set aside the authority and the leadership of Moses. Now, I find this very interesting. Keep in mind that we're talking about a relationship that God had with His people, which was according to Him delivering His people out of bondage, leading them to Mount Sinai, where that they received the Torah, they received the law. And I believe that the rebellion there of Korah took place after they had received the law. Now I may I may be mistaken about that. I don't I don't I believe that that, that that's the time frame that we're looking at here. So these people here in our text, they're setting aside the authority and leadership of who? Me? No. You? No. No. They're setting aside the authority and the leadership of Jesus Christ. Verse 12 says these are spots. Now, now in the, in, uh, many translators prefer to, to look at that as a spot on your garment. Like if I had a mud spot right here on my white shirt, you know, there's, there's spots. They, they, it's uh, related to uh, the, the, the actual uh, garment that we see later on in the text that has been polluted by the, the flesh, these people were never made righteous. Okay, the word literally means reefs, uh, as in, uh, you know, uh, rocky uh, reefs lying just below the surface of the water that a ship runs into and becomes shipwrecked. They are reefs in your feasts. And I want you to think of the, the first Passover here. I've touched on this in, in a number of videos. Uh, the uh, in, in Exodus chapter 12, it, where it, we, it said, the text says, uh, And thus shall ye eat it with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and ye eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now, it's difficult for me not to see loins girded as righteousness. Just like in our armor that we put on, we put on the righteousness of Christ. Sandals on your feet, well, that means you're going someplace with this. The gospel, preaching the gospel, going forward to preach the gospel it's a gospel journey. Staff in hand. What kind of staff? Staff, you know, is that is that 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 shepherd's crook that you you know? I don't believe so. I believe it's it's a staff to keep you from tripping and falling. It's gonna it's it's gonna be a a hard, rigorous journey. 
and eat it in haste. Now that word, I looked that word up in the Hebrew, uh, kipazon, it, the word means hurried flight, as in you're, you are suddenly to be delivered from bondage. And these are said to be spots, reefs, in your feasts of charity, that is love, the word there is love, in your feast of love, when they feast with you, feeding themselves, feeding themselves. They already know everything. They can't be taught. They can't be taught. They're doing it for themselves. You know, our concern ought to be for others, but these individuals are doing it for themselves. Jesus to Peter, feed my sheep. Same word. When they feast with you, feeding themselves. The same word there with Peter, feed my sheep. I believe I, uh, in, in either the last video or the one before that, I, I read some from Ezekiel chapter 34. Uh, I'll, I'll read verses 8 through 10 again. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherd search for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. I love how Scripture cross-references. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand and cause them to cease from feeding the flock. God causes them to cease from feeding the flock. Keep in mind that God ordained these individuals to creep in unawares. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves anymore, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. Okay? I will deliver my flock from their mouth. How will he do that? Truth. Doctrine. That they may be, may not be meat for them. They're feeding on these individuals. They're feeding. They're, I believe they're they're just they're sucking the life blood out of these individuals. We were we we learned in Colossians. If you if you followed us through Colossians, you you saw how that we are not to allow ourselves to be robbed of all those blessings that God had had given us in Christ. What I find really interesting about uh, Korah uh, is he tells Moses, "It's not from God that you've received these commandments. You've invented these yourself." This is what Korah said to Moses. And, and so Korah incited all the people against Moses, arguing, and get this, <laughs> arguing that it was impossible to endure the laws that Moses had instituted. Well, first of all, it wasn't Moses that instituted these laws. It was God. But what Korah is telling Moses is it's impossible to endure the laws that you've given us. Now, keep in mind that this was under law, okay? And what I find interesting about is it, that is that today it's just the reverse. It's impossible to live according to grace alone, the finished work of, cl of Christ alone. It's impossible to endure this, this grace alone stuff, okay? You know, the... The, the finished work of Christ alone, you know, are you telling me it's just Christ, none of ourselves? That's impossible to endure. You know, Christ, the fulfillment of the law, okay? We have to keep the law. It's just the reverse. It seems like Satan attacked the law when that was God's established order, okay? And now that it, it's not, now that we're not under law, but grace, 
now that we've died to the law in order that we might live unto God, bear fruit unto God, now that it is not, well, what does he do? He attacks the doctrine of the believer not under law and the finished work of Christ who is the fulfillment of the law. I hope you, I hope you, I said that right. Isaiah chapter 57 verse 20, but the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. Isaiah 57 20. Philippians chapter 2 verse 15 is interesting. That you may be blameless and harmless the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation among whom you shine as lights in the world. The word lights is the word uh, foster, fo, fo meaning lights, where we get our word photography. Uh, foster. Aster is the word for star. And we know, we know a, a meteor uh, shines brightly and then it burns out. If you were, uh, uh, lived, had lived back then and, and you didn't really understand astronomy the way that uh, we've come to understand that now, and you saw all the fixed stars in the heavens, and you saw stars that seem to be wander out of their place, which we know today are planets, This is uh this is this was the Hebrew the word that they had in mind, the thought that they had in mind when it came to them being wandering stars. The word is star. It and so it disappears, this meteor it, after after it flashes, it burns out, it flashes bright for a while. That's what these individuals in the fellowship they do or in their life, that's what they do. And then all of a sudden, they burn out. Just like the meteor, they burn out. And they disappear into the dark void of blackness. Deep space. And, and what that reminds me of, folks, is them being blotted out, okay? And I've, and I've, and I've, I've said this, I've suggested this in, in numerous videos. To be blotted out of the Book of Life is to be as though you never did exist. Psalm 69, 28, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written with the righteous. That's the into the Lamb's book of life. There's two books, folks. There's two books. There's the book of life and the Lamb's book of life. These are blotted out of the book of life. They were never written into the Lamb's book of life. And they are twice dead. So all are written into the book of life. They have to be. I mean, you've, common sense will tell you that you have to be written into something to be erased from it, okay? You can't erase your name on a piece of paper unless you fir first written it down on the piece of paper, okay? All right? It's, a, you know, just like something that dies has to first be alive. Nothing, nothing dies unless it was first alive. It's like the seed that you put into the ground. The seed's not dead that you put into the ground. You don't put a dead seed in the ground and then all of a sudden it, it springs forth to life. What you do is you put a living seed in the ground and as a result of you putting it into the ground, it dies. Okay? If you're into farming, gardening, planting, anything, Every single time that you do that, 
It is God reminding you of the death, burial, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, all are written into the book of life. They have to be. They have to be for, for, them, for them to be blotted out of it. And just like nothing dies unless it's first alive. And only the redeemed are written into the Lamb's book of life. And no one is blotted out of the Lamb's book of life. The text, our text goes on to say, without fear. Without fear. That's fear as in reverence, respect for God. Reverence for God. They have no reverence for God. There are clouds without water, carried about of winds, and we know what well, we know what we're told. We're told not to be tossed to and fro uh, with every wind of doctrine. Okay, Ephesians chapter four that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. If that's not if that's not who we're looking at in Jude here, I'll eat my laptop. Okay? But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. And our text goes on further to say, trees whose fruit withers without fruit. Anybody who's read John chapter 15 knows that we abide in him. We, the branch, abide in the vine the fruit is produced through the, the, the vine, not the, the branch. Uh, the branch profits nothing. In, in the branch dwells no good thing. Okay, all right. It's, it, it, it starts, begins, the life comes through the vine. Again, we're looking at a, a gardening, uh, farming uh, illustration. God loves to use these. What's really interesting is, 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 is the way that God illustrates all of this in, 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 the, in the many illustrations that he gives us about new birth. Well, no one ever caused themselves to be born. You, you didn't decide that you were going to be born in the town that you were born in or through the parents that you had. or You, you didn't choose. You didn't decide to be born. And that's the, the illustration he uses for new birth. He uses illustrations such as these, everything from the ground to the sky, from earth to heaven, everything in between earth and heaven. He, God has used to, to illustrate to you the point uh, that it is not about you, but it's about Jesus Christ. In every single lesson, every single analogy, Every single parable, every single allegory, every single historical account, every aspect of life, even, even with animals, brute beasts, he uses animals. I mean, he is, it's almost as if the Holy Spirit has gone out on a limb to get the point across to us that we cannot, there's no, we have no excuse, no reason to miss the truth that, that is contained within all of these parameters. Trees whose fruit withers without fruit, twice dead. I mean, they're feeding themselves. So, so they're obviously not sitting in the pews as corpses. They're not twice dead in the sense that they're physically dead. They're, they're there within the fellowship, plucked up by the roots, 
Every plant which my Father has not planted shall be rooted up. Isn't that what our Lord said? Verse 13, raging waves of the sea. Foaming out their own shame. Wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. What we see here in the examples of Cain, Balaam, and Korah in Jude. All, all taken straight from the text. This is not anybody making anything up. It's not reading into the text something that's not there. It's not what we call eisegesis. It is pure exegesis. It's, it's taking from the text what's there. What we see is we see wrong sacrifice. They think that the, their sacrifices should be acceptable to God, but it's not wrong worship an attention to to wrong uh, wrong order wrong authority wrong leadership wrong motives that's what we see and these individuals are bold they're fearless they're irreverent though they have a, an appearance of godliness but they are ungodly. They're envious. They're envious. And they are unlearned, unstable. They're harmful. We see that they're harmful. They're damaging. We're being, we're being warned concerning these individuals because they scatter the sheep. They feed upon the sheep. They're fleshly. They're offering the wrong sacrifice themselves, which is the flesh. They're thinking that something good comes from the, the ground or from the earth or from natural means, exercises of, of self-effort. It's not acceptable to God. It's natural. It's, it's earthy. It's, it's flesh. It's legalistic. They promote lordship salvation. They are licentious. They're liars. They're without faith. They are faithless. They're experience based. They walk by sight, not by faith. They're doctrinally unstable, tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, themselves feeding, shepherding themselves, feeding and caring for themselves with no real concern for God's people. They're hidden reefs. They, they cause shipwreck. They shipwreck the faith of others. They, they don't bear any fruit. They're spiritually dead. And they think that they have all the answers. They can't be taught, but they can be bought. They're just unstable in all their ways. They persecute God's children. Hating them. Which basically amounts is tantamount to murder. They're blasphemers. They're mockers. They're murmurers and complainers. And they flatter others for the sake of advantage. And they are ordained by God to this condemnation. Okay? The text could not be more clear. If you are a Christian who does not like the doctrine of election, I got, I got news for you. God ordained them to this, con, this condemnation. He, God ordained them. Okay? One of the greatest 
challenges that you will ever have as a believer is facing the opposition to that truth that God has a right to both choose and to care for his own family. Well, I'm out of time. Look, I love you all. I truly do. And I'm praying for all of you. Uh, we are indeed living in uncertain times. I'm praying for all of you uh, everywhere who have been uh, impacted by this uh, new novel virus. I pray that uh, God keep you healthy, happy, blessed, and safe. Until next time, this is Steve. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.